Good day and welcome to the Startup Stop. My name is Roger Pierce, and I'll introduce you to my lovely co-host in just a minute. But the Startup Stop is all about answering questions from new entrepreneurs, and that's why you're hopefully here today, so that you can get some answers to your questions. You can also ask some questions live using the chat feature on uh, Google Live Hangouts, and we'll get to your questions as best we can. Um, who am I and why am I talking to you here today? My name again is Roger Pierce. I am a startup expert, a small business expert. I have had 13 small businesses. I've been self-employed my entire life. I really don't think there is a better career choice than to work for yourself, as hopefully you'll learn throughout this broadcast. I am the co-author of a startup book, and my company today is a content marketing agency. We help big brands around the world to engage small business owners using small business content that we produce. And if you're an Evan Carmichael fan uh, and his uh, first book, your one word, my one word is start. If you haven't read Evan's book, make sure you do, as well as the second book, uh, the Top Secrets to Business Success. But enough about me, I want to introduce my lovely co-host, Lily Ma. She's an entrepreneur, coach, and public speaker. Welcome, Lily. Hello, everyone. Well, Happy New Year. It's nice to be back. We had a couple of weeks off, so I'm really excited to be here. Uh, like Roger, I, I love entrepreneurs, and I have a startup myself. I, I started a business from scratch about eight months ago out of nothing. And, uh, and now I'm actually at a position that I have hired on my first team member and things are going really well. So I'm always excited to help entrepreneurs whenever I can. So I have three questions for Roger and hopefully some of you will tune in and ask questions in the chat as well. Roger, are we ready to answer the first question? Hopefully they aren't very hard questions, Lily, because I'm still just fresh off vacation myself. Oh, you're fine. You're always ready. <laughs> Always ready. Okay, so the first question comes from Isaiah. So Isaiah is asking, I have $6,000 saved for junk removal service. Is that enough? So that's it's a two-part question. And the second part is, should I hire friends and family just starting the business of junk removal or wait for insurance and hire new people? Great question. Thank you so much, Isaiah. And thank you, Lily, for bringing it to me. I would have to say, first of all, the junk removal business is a growing industry. Lots of great uh, leaders in that field, like 1-800-GOT-JUNK. So that means you're probably in the right space at the right time, all things said. Of course, it is going to depend on which markets you choose to operate in. Some cities might be more competitive than others. It's always a good idea, Isaiah, to study up on the competition, know what their strengths are, know what their weaknesses are, figure out their price, maybe mystery shop them a little bit. And all this in your business plan, I'm assuming, which is essential to any new business, especially in a highly competitive field like junk removal. Take some time, write that business plan template. If you want to contact me, I'm happy to share a free business plan template with you. So to answer your question specifically, you know, when people ask, do I have enough money? The answer they always don't want to hear is, it depends. The formula I like to use when calculating startup cost requirements is um, called the startup budget. And usually you should allow for six months of operating costs plus whatever it's going to take you in terms of capital costs. So six months of operating costs or working capital plus your hard costs, your capital costs. So in your business, let's say you need, for instance, a pickup truck or a cube van to haul all that junk away, that would be probably a, a hard cost. You could lease it, I suppose, but let's say it's a startup cost. Let's say you need a decent truck for about $20,000. Then your working capital costs, how much do you need to run the business and hopefully pay yourself a little bit of money, not much in the first little while to, to power the business. So you might need advertising, you might need to hire a part-time helper, you might need to do some online promotion, do some business cards, get a website up, all that stuff's gonna cost money. So you gotta total up all the things you're gonna spend your money on, and break it down into months to figure out your monthly working capital requirements. And that might be, let's say, $2,000 a month, all told. So six months times $2,000 a month would be $12,000, plus that $20,000 for the truck, 
maybe some signage, but let's assume that's included. So what are we up to? $32,000. Add a little bit in for contingency, maybe 10%, would bring you up to around $35,000. Now all this should be in your business plan, and the next step is to go out and raise that money. You can raise that money a number of ways. You can go and get a bank loan. Not always the easiest thing to do. You can use some personal savings. You can get some money from friends or family or investors. Or you can go and pre-sell some sales to customers, which is what I always like to do to make sure that you're not uh, going too much into your own into your own debt or your own pocket. So you've got a couple of options to raise that money. The main thing is you have a number in mind now that will get you through the first half a year. And that half a year assumes no sales at all. So it's kind of like a worst case scenario. So imagine making no money for six months, you'd still be covered with your working capital and your capital cost requirements covered. If you're gonna make sales, and I certainly hope you do within six months, then that'll just put you that much more ahead. Should make things easier for you. Your second part of your question is, you know, hiring family versus strangers, basically. And I have my own thoughts on this. It's a lot easier, Isaiah, to fire strangers than it is family if they don't work out. It's a nice idea to bring in family and friends. Be careful because like I just said, you can't always get rid of family or friends as easily as you could someone who you don't have a, a personal connection to. It's also hard when you, to change the relationship. You know, your best friend, when your best friend, maybe you like to go for drinks and have some fun or play some, some sports together. As soon as you hire that person, the relationship definitely changes and not always for the better. So I'm a big fan of keeping it separate for now, um, at least until you kind of find your business sea legs. Maybe once you get better at running a business and know what's involved, you might look at bringing some family on board. But even then, arm's length is probably best. So, But everyone's different. Some people love to work with family and they can't wait to bring in their own, their own relations to the business. But for now, I recommend you, you keep those worlds separate. Although I will say, Isaiah, that with $6,000, you're not going to be hiring too many people anyway right now. Chances are it's going to be you and that truck uh, hustling 80 hours a week to get the business going. I would firmly recommend you don't hire anybody. You use all your available funds, plus some more, $35,000 as you recall, to uh, get the business going, to advertise, to promote, to get customers, and you're the one that's going to have to do the labor. Once you start to, to make some, some extra cash, then you can look at hiring perhaps some part-time help. Strangers, not family. Lily, what are your thoughts on this? I love, I, I love it. it. You were so detail-oriented with, um, with, uh, with that answer, and it's mind-boggling how much money is required to start a business. I think a lot of people don't see that, which is important. That's why it's important for you to do a business plan and really work out the finances because on the surface it seems like six thousand dollars should be enough but it's not when you do the math it's you're at thirty five thousand dollars that's massive so i think um that's an eye opener for everybody and uh it's to really think about how much money is is actually required so Thank you, Roger. I do appreciate that. And and anybody who has questions about us business plans, I always want to direct them to you. Uh, the second part question about hiring family members, it's so dicey. It's such a dicey situation. Uh, if you have amazing family members and friends who believe in your vision and they want to see you succeed, they will work harder than anybody else for you. But if you if it doesn't work out, then you have some really awkward Thanksgiving dinners and Christmas dinners. So I think Isaiah would be the person to really know for himself if that's a good idea or not. If you're trying to hire friends and family because you're you're trying to save some money, uh, that's probably not a good idea. But if you want to hire them on because they believe in your mission and you truly trust them and you believe that's the right thing to do, then go ahead. So. Oh. I'll also add to that too, Lily, what you just said, Thanksgiving dinners. I'm reminded of an entrepreneur uh, who worked with family in, in her new business and it wasn't clear because they were family, the family member thought that they were part of the ownership of the business. So it wasn't okay. clear that, that they weren't, that they were considered employees by, by the founder. It just got messy and then all of a sudden when the business started to do well, the 
non-owning family member uh, started to assert some rights, and it just got really ugly after after a while. So we've got to be careful because if you're not paying family much and they're helping you out, gee, do they think they're part owners, even though there's no shares being issued or anything like that or documentation, they might come back and, and bug you for that later. So I, I'm with you. It's better to have an arm's length relationship in this case, maybe documented up well like you would any employee when he can afford to hire someone. Yeah, it's so true. Uh, I actually have a follow-up question for that. Uh, when you're starting out a business, for example, you're starting out from complete scratch, nothing at all, and you want to bring in a partner. You truly think that you need a partner. I know the question is always like, do you really need a partner or can you do it on your own? You feel like you need a partner. How do you know what's a fair share in terms of the workload, in terms of the ownership, in terms of the payout? How do you how do you know when it's fair? A fair share is for you to take the majority. <laughs> if it's truly your idea and you're the one getting the ball rolling, then you should be the owner, majority owner. You should have the most shares. That might change over time. You can still have you know majority ownership without having fifty one percent. In the case of, of two two owners things start to get diluted as the company grows. But it's important to hang on to majority share ownership, whatever that percentage might be, just so that you've got the control of, of the founder. I think what's fair is a, um, a trial arrangement. You know, Like you just said, you really need a partner in the first place. Maybe you just don't talk about shares. Maybe there's a discussion about shares after six months to see if the two of you can work well together, for starters. And then it's, uh, you know, hey, I'd like to dial you in for 20 or 25% of the company. And maybe there's more to be offered as, as, things, as things go on. I never find that truly two people come together equal, equal. I always find one person's got more skin in the game or more money or more energy or more commitment to the idea. And that person should have, have the majority shares, in my opinion. Sounds good. I think we're off to a great start. Second question comes from Oren. So Oren is asking, I'm a, oh my goodness, God lost it. I'm a teen and I wanted to become an app developer, but unable to get idea help. It's not super clear what it is that Oren is asking. So Raj, I'm gonna throw it on, throw it over to you. Good question. Thank you so much, Oren. This is more of a mentoring question, in my opinion. I'm always a big fan of, of modeling masters, as Evan Carmichael would agree. You know, who can you find who's been really successful in the space you want to get into and learn from them? Not necessarily copy them, but, but pretty darn close. Learn how they succeeded, follow the same steps. So there are thousands, not millions, of app developers out there. Can you find one maybe in your city or town doesn't even have to be in your city or town. You could always Skype or connect by FaceTime. But someone you can emulate their success. If you want to make it big in, in the TV industry, you would, you would follow the steps of someone like an Oprah, right? So that's a big target, of course, to go after, but a big model to, to, to copy. But who can you go after that's reachable for you, who you can emulate, who you can copy their successful steps in your own field? So app developers, do a Google search. Find out who's in your area, and you're going to try to approach them to see if they'll mentor you. Ask them to see if ask them to answer your questions for starters. Don't pose the mentoring question just yet. But start a relationship. Chances are, if you're in a faraway city or you're in a different app space, a successful app developer will agree to at least answer your initial questions and then perhaps take you on a monthly mentoring role. If you have trouble finding someone online, then look to your local business organizations to see if you can find someone or connect with someone in that space. Your chamber of commerce would be a good place to start. Um, talk to local business owners, say, hey, do you know any app developers or, or people who are in the online market? Um, and see what they can do to refer you to, to, to people they know. I'm also a big fan of Junior Achievement. Junior Achievement is an organization I was a member of when I was a teenager, and it taught me the basics of running starting and running a business. You work with other teens to actually run a company. I'm not quite sure how old you are exactly, but Junior Achievement might be a place for you to get some business training as well. What do you think about this, Lily? 
I do. I, I love how, how you uh, interpreted that question is uh, more of a mentorship uh, question rather than actually creating the app. Uh, mentorship is obviously very important to me. I have a mentor and I'm also a mentor to other folks as well. Uh, my question for you is, um, you as a mentor, what is it that you're looking for in a mentee? Is there, because there, I get a lot of people asking me to be the mentor and and it's always it's always trying to figure out how to balance my time. How much time do I really want to commit into this person? So is there certain things that you look for in a mentee? Somewhere in my system, I have mentee mentor contract. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can find them online. They're not hard to come up with. And they're pretty serious because you know, look, both people are committing time and energy here. So there have to be some ground rules. And the ground rules to me are as follows. Number one, if, if you want me to be a mentor to you, respect my time. And that means things like show up or call in as, as we agreed. Don't tell me you're too busy or you forgot or you slept in or whatever. Be, be, be courteous of my time commitment to you. And be prepared. I hate it when uh, a mentee kind of wings it and just says, well, hey, what do you want to talk about today, Roger? You got to send me some questions in advance. You got to you know, show me that you've given some forethought to how we can best spend our time together. Those types of things are really important to a successful mentor-mentee relationship. And there has to be an out clause. What are the grounds for breaking up? Is it because one or both parties didn't feel committed? Is it because one or both parties isn't getting value? That's fair. Maybe the mentor you thought you were getting isn't the person after all and you want to get out of it. Have a bit of an exit clause in the relationship agreement so that both parties can break it up if necessary. I'm sure you've worked with a lot of people yourself, Lily, and, and, and you know, you've got your own preferences about working with someone on that too. Yeah, I do. I think uh, for me is um, I love a hard worker and I love people who take action. So I think uh, the quality that I look for is, because uh, sometimes you don't know. When you first meet someone, you're not 100% sure what it is that they're really looking for. So I do, I have some screening type things that I do with them to see if they are the kinds of people that actually take action. Like you were saying, you want them to do their homework, you want them to do the work, show up on time, respect your time, respect their time too. And there's a lot of things in it. It's, um, I'm always, I, I wanna help everyone. That's the truth. I, every single person that comes my way, I want to take them on. But as my business is getting busier and my time is becoming less and less, is uh, is a constant evaluation of what I should prioritize. So I wanted to get some some feedback from you, so that way I could keep in mind for myself when I have to create certain boundaries. Okay. So I have the third and last question for you, Roger. It's, uh, do you recommend a book or source that teaches you how to make money or at least touches on that subject? I feel like I need to learn to make money on the side, in parentheses, to support my main project from Sandy. Sure, Sandy, that's an easy question. Um, the $100 Startup is a great book by Chris Gillibo, if I'm saying that right. The hundred dollars startup. Just Google it. Amazon will have it. Talks about you don't need to spend a lot of money to start up a business. It provides lots of examples that uh, that you can you can use as food for thought. Another great book is The Lean Startup by Eric Ries. R I E S. Uh, talking about you know a lean startup, how how it doesn't require a whole lot of money to get a business going. Look, I'm a big believer in $1,000 or less, especially for a service-based business. It doesn't have to start a lot of money. 100 bucks might be a little, lean, a little too lean. But for $1,000 or less, you can certainly get into a consulting or service-based business. All you need is a computer, a mobile phone, an internet connection, and away you go, right? A bank account, and that's easy to open up. It doesn't have to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. In fact, if you're looking at starting a business that costs hundreds of thousands of dollars, then perhaps maybe you're looking at the wrong business because chances are you're looking at a restaurant or a retail store, you're going to spend all this money before you make any, any money at all, and that's a much, much riskier proposition. Go for a business that's less than $1,000. majority of businesses in North America, something like 75% of all small businesses are, are, are service-based. 
right? And service-based businesses are always less expensive to start than retail or manufacturing. So if you've got a great idea for a concierge business or a, uh, or a chefing at home business or a, a website service of some sort, that's the kind of thinking I like to encourage. And those are the types of books that you should be reading. You should also Google search. Sandy, do a Google search, best part-time businesses to start. I know Entrepreneur Magazine or entrepreneur.com publishes an annual list of like 25 great part-time businesses to start or, or inexpensive businesses to start. So a lot of this legwork is, is done for you. You can get out there and just look at what they're publishing and, and think, okay, there's an idea for me or maybe I come up with a similar idea. It doesn't have to cost a lot of money. The main thing is don't spend a lot of money. And get the business going, get the basics up and running, forget the bells and whistles, and just start earning some cash. What are your thoughts, Lily? Oh, I like it. I'm a service-based entrepreneur myself, and I love businesses that doesn't require a lot of money to start with. Uh, I am I am in a fortunate um, situation because I do have an investor, Evan. So when Evan and I got together, he decided to invest into my business because I was still working full time, and I was doing a lot of side projects. I was doing workshops, I was doing different coaching sessions and all of that. And he really believed in me and wanted me to go full on in in my business. And I was fortunate enough to get investment there and mentorship as well. But I'm a firm believer is don't spend money until you make money. Absolutely. My business requires me to have a laptop. I have a laptop, I have internet connection. Usually I use Wi-Fi, so that's free. <laughs> and uh, I have a phone and that's that's all I really need. I don't need anything beyond that. And um, uh, recently I brought on an assistant because I started making money in my business. Nice. But uh, I don't, I don't, I'm very lean. I don't, uh, I don't have a fancy website. I don't have fancy business cards or anything like that because it's really not required in the beginning. Absolutely. You're in a great, great example of a low cost startup business. I love it. And that's the way most people should be thinking. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. Do All right, Roger. I'm just going to check the chat to see if we have any questions. I don't believe we do. Can we oh, uh, do today's not? startup stop suggestion? Yes, please. Go ahead. I want to hear your thoughts on this too, coming off the Christmas holiday. Um, but today's Startup Stop suggestion, which is just a general tip that I th think might be relevant to today's talk, is don't work all the time. And this is coming from a guy who just, just finished two weeks vacation in Florida with, with my family. And I guess I'm thinking about this right now and reminded of it. You know, you can't work all the time in your new business. It's very easy to get wrapped up in all the excitement the momentum and the endless to-do list of starting a new business that we think it's impossible to take a, a break, take a vacation. And when I say vacation, it could be a long weekend, could be a week, could be a couple of weeks, could be a week here and there throughout the year. But the main thing is you need to take that break. You need to take that vacation. You know, when you do, you're going to accomplish a couple of things. A, you're going to refresh and recharge and rejuvenate. B, you're going to expose yourself to some new ideas and some new inputs if you're traveling at all or even going to another city for your vacation. And finally, you're just gonna get a, a perspective on things, you know. Lily, you mentioned to me before we started today's broadcast how you've been able to get develop some clarity uh, about your business goals for the year, having taken a bit of a break over the holidays. And that's brilliant because that does your business more good, I think, than working insane 100 hour work weeks, right? So I always say to new entrepreneurs, the business will be there when you get back. Plan those breaks, take a rest, the rewards are worth it. Don't worry about falling behind. You'll come back and actually work smarter and better than if you didn't take the break and kept on slugging. Plus your family is gonna appreciate seeing you now and then too. You know, the old story goes that Bill Gates famously slept on the office floor during his early years because there was just so much work to do and he loved it. And that was kind of the state of being at Microsoft in the early days, work, 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 work. And the media kind of perpetuates that myth too, that Star should be sleeping on their office floor at the time. I disagree. I think there's more benefits to taking a break than there is to nonstop work. What do you think, Lily? 
Oh, I agree. And uh, I am, I'm guilty of that. I do work all the time. And th the reason for that is it's kind of, it's a blurred line between when I'm working and when I'm not working. Cause I'm always thinking about my business and at some capacity, but I do agree. You need to step away. Uh, I'm a startup. So a lot of things that I started, started in the beginning for, so before we got on the call, I was talking to Roger about how I initially thought my business is going to be around my speaking, which I'm still going to do, but it was going to be speaking and then a little bit of coaching. And then I went into doing 50, 50 coaching and speaking. And now I realize that I'm going to do mostly coaching and a little bit of speaking. And that clarity came from taking a couple of days off. And also what I do is recently, this is what I developed is um, between nine till 10 PM every single night, I don't get it every single night, but every single night I try from 9 till 10 p.m. before I go to bed to sit by the candlelight and really just have the time to myself and really reflect in what has happened. And that's also a time that I spend with my husband, see what he's up to. And that one hour period that I've had gave me so much more clarity than anything else than just like sitting in front of a computer and working, working, working. So I do believe in it. It doesn't have to be Hey, if you're a startup um, entrepreneur, you're saying, I can't, I can't afford to, I can't afford a uh, two week vacation or four week vacation or even a weekend away, one hour. Anything, anything to just to kind of take a step back. And there's a lot of creativity that comes from it. I have also done things like when I'm stuck on an idea and I can't really move ahead with it and I'm just, I've tried everything, I'm just, I'm up against a wall. What I do is I do something very creative. I like to enjoy culture. I will go watch a show, a live show. Uh, folks, American folks are watching like a Broadway show or here, you know, we have Ed Mervish Theater. Watch a show, go to a museum, go for a walk. And a lot of ideas come to me that way. So I do agree. Break is important for your business. Absolutely. Very good. Well, I'll be asking you throughout this next year when you're taking your breaks, Lily, to keep you honest. I know. I, 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 I can't, I can't, I have, I have no words. I have no words. And this is the, um, it's a personality. I've been like that when I was in the corporate world, I was always a person that my manager would, would call close to our year end. You haven't taken your vacation. You need to take your vacations. <laughs> so I'm working on it. It's a, it's a daily practice. So I'm, I'm getting better as I get older. A New Year's resolution. Yes. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's it for today. Any other questions coming in? That's it? I think that's it for us today. Okay. No worries. Well, thank you so much, Lily. Thank you, Roger. It's great to be back, and I look forward to many, many more to come. For those of you wondering when we're going to be back at it, same time next week. Mm -hmm. we, we broadcast Tuesdays at 3 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. We hope you'll come back next week and check out more suggestions from the startup stock. Bye for now. Bye, Lily. Thank you so much, guys. Bye-bye.